Um, last time we were talking about uh, floyd warshall algorithm. And we pretty much finished talking about that. But I, I wanted to make just one more comment, because um, that, that material is not in your book. But I, I mentioned that you can, there's a very good discussion of it, a reasonable discussion of it at any rate, in, um, in Wikipedia. So you can see the details of that in Wikipedia, and that's, that's fine. The, thing, the one thing that I did object to in Wikipedia is they have the following statement. It says, Floyd War the floyd Warshall algorithm compares all possible paths through the graph between each pair of vertices. OK, so we saw a dynamic programming solution to this problem of finding the shortest path between every pair of vert vertices. And they're n -square, roughly n squared pairs of vertices. And the algorithm runs in n cube time. OK. Um, by dynamic programming. Now, this, this statement from Wikipedia is that the floyd warshall algorithm compares all possible paths to the graph between each pair of vertices. How many people would say that's a fair assessment of what the floyd warshall algorithm does? OK, how many people would say that's not a fair statement about what floyd warshall algorithm does? OK, and how many people wouldn't say anything? How many people haven't said anything yet? OK, uh, this is not good. We had zero on my first question, one on the second question, and one on the third. OK, but there's some 56 of you there. Uh, everybody should have answered one, you know, at least once. So how many people think this is a fair statement? How many people don't think it's a fair statement? OK, two now, or three, four. And how many people haven't answered? OK. Now how many people haven't answered? At any rate, um, <laughs> there's still some of you out there. OK. Um, Brian, that's your name? Yeah. Why did you say uh, it's not a fair statement? Because it's not really comparing OK, the main, main point was that it's not really comparing. When you say it, it compares all of them, it, that implies it somehow explicitly looks at every path between every pair of, of nodes and evaluates its distance and then compares them and finds out which is the shortest and so on. Well, you can just do a few ex little examples to convince yourself that the number of paths, even between some fixed pair of points, is vastly larger, can be vastly larger than n cubed. The algorithm runs in n cubed time. If it's explicitly looking at every pair of paths, or explicitly enumerating paths, there's no way it can run in n cubed time. And the whole point of dynamic programming, the, the, the spectacular success of dynamic programming, is that it can find the shortest path, not only between a fixed pair of nodes, but in fact, in the floyd Warshall case, for every pair of nodes, it finds the shortest path, or the distance, anyway, of the shortest path by not explicitly enumerating paths, by doing something which is guaranteed to give you the optimal distance, the shortest path, but doesn't explicitly enumerate them. And so this, you know, maybe if you parse this very, very carefully, you could say it's, it's OK. floyd Warshall compares. But it depends on what you mean by compare. If it's an explicit comparison of all possible paths, that's wrong and, and misses completely the whole spirit and, and elegance and importance of dynamic programming. But you see this kind of statement all over the place. This isn't just from this Wikipedia, whoever wrote that article. Um, you just see it again and again and again. It kind of makes you wonder whether the person understands what's really going on in dynamic programming. Uh, and how powerful it is. And it's not just brute force enumeration. Now, the other three, you had your hands up saying, no, this wasn't a fair statement. Was that what you were going to say? Yeah. I was also going to say, because you asked the question. You went about the question. Oh, yeah, well, that's, yeah, OK. Yeah, yeah. Right. Um, yeah, that's, that's the trick answer, not the trick question. Yeah, right. OK. All right, so that's, that's all I'm going to say about that algorithm. We didn't do traceback, um, but that might be on your, uh, that's a good question on your, uh, for your homework, perhaps. OK, so today what I want to talk about is another topic that's also not in your book, 
um, but I have notes that I'll put up on the web for that. And this is a problem that relates to paths, not shortest paths per se, but paths in graphs, and shows how to solve a particular problem by casting it as a problem of a path in a graph and asking a question about the existence or non-existence of certain kinds of paths, and gives um, what I think is an amazing result, one that I, I found um, very surprising when I first learned about it. And so this is the problem that's called unique decipherability. Unique. Uh, decipherability. And this is actually a problem that um, it came up in the 1940s and had some importance in uh, coding theory for a very short time, and then f for reasons that I won't explain, um, became unimportant in coding theory. But it still remains an interesting question in computer science and in algorithms. And so um, without really talking about the coding theory basis of the problem, just think of it in the following way. You're given uh, a set of strings and that's called a code. Okay, so let me give you an example. So, for example, C could be a, B, A, 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 B, B, A, B, and B, A. Okay, so each one of these is a string. So this, this code has one, two, three, four, five strings. Each string is also sometimes called a, a code word. And what you're able to do is make messages by selecting code words and concatenating them. You can use a code word as many times as you like, so there's no, le there's no limit on the length of the messages that you can create. So here's another example of a message. Uh, for example, ABA, ABB, ABB. B A A B. There's there's a there's a message that can be made from this code because it uses code words, uh, concatenates code words uh, together to make a message. So for example, A B A is a code word. A B B is a code word. A B B is a code word. B A A B. Right. So that um, is a message, okay. Now, um, just jumping ahead a little bit, can anybody see whether there's another way of writing this message as a concatenation of code words with different code words? I see a hand up, yeah. Yeah, the uh, first uh, code word can be broken up into A, B, and then A. Yeah, so rather trivially, this one could be broken up into A, B, then followed by A. And there may be other ways of doing that. So already, just on this first little piece, we see that if you have this code and you receive this message, then you don't know whether the message was uh, the A, B, A code word first, or whether it was code word A, B first, then followed by code word A. So this message, this is an example of a message that is not uniquely decipherable. Of a message that is not uniquely decipherable. or uniquely decipherable is this going to be abbreviated as UD. Okay, so 
getting messages that are not uniquely decipherable is not a good thing because there's ambiguity there. You don't know. Um, on the other hand, if we use this message, uh, a, b, b, a, b, well, how do we parse that? That's a, b, b, followed by a, b. And is there another way of parsing it? Well, um, the longest code word is 3, so there's no longer one than that. A shorter code word is AB, but, okay, so you could parse it AB, and then you have BAB as a way of doing that. Well, there's a way of doing BA, but then you're stuck because there's no B. So it looks like the bottom parse is the only way of parsing this particular message. Okay, So this is an example of a message that is uniquely decipherable. Notice that you don't get to determine, you don't determine that it's uniquely decipherable until you're at the very end. You're going along here and you're able to parse it A, B, B, A, and so on, but you get to the end and you realize that alternative parse isn't going to work. And this was the only parse. So this is, is uniquely decipherable. Okay? So we know what a code is, code words, messages. Some messages are not uniquely decipherable. Some messages are uniquely decipherable. Okay? So another definition. Given a code, C, um, well, a code actually shouldn't say given that. A code C is called uniquely decipherable if and only if every every message that can be created from C is uniquely decipherable. Okay? So that's the definition. Um, that's, a, that's a perfectly fine definition. I haven't stated a problem yet, although you can imagine what the next problem is. But, for, for example, is this code uniquely decipherable? No, it's not uniquely decipherable because we've already seen a message that it can be made from it that's not uniquely decipherable. And the definition says that a code will be called uniquely decipherable if only if every message that can be created from it is uniquely decipherable. Okay, so now a problem. Given a code, determine if it is uniquely decipherable. And of course, when we say determine in this class, we mean come up with an algorithm that can always determine whether the code is uniquely decipherable. And, of course, we want something that's efficient. Now, if you take sort of the naive, the most brute force approach to trying to answer this question, you might think about generating all possible messages. You have, you have a code, and you, want, you need to know whether every message that you can create from it is uniquely decipherable. So you could think of conceptually generating all those messages and for each one testing if they're uniquely decipherable, although we don't even yet have an algorithm to test whether a message is uniquely decipherable. But imagining we did have a an algorithm that could test whether a message is uniquely decipherable, what's, what's wrong with that conceptual <laughs> approach? Yeah. Uh, hold on a second. Mike, uh, Stephen, yes. So, uh, the, it's because we have an exponential of strings because uh, with n code words, we could, I mean, it would be, there would be a ridiculously large number of strings to go through. 
I, I couldn't hear any of that. But but I think what you said is that um, that that's not possible because there's an infinite number of messages, right? So that would be that would be conceptually. Uh, saying, oh, the answer is to enumerate this infinite set and then look at each of the elements. And that's clearly not what we want. It's not even finite. The algorithm isn't, isn't even guaranteed to terminate because you have um, an infinite number of messages that you can create. There's no bound on the length of the messages. Okay, so um, again, Stephen, what problem does that remind you of? Well, that's, a, that's definitely a trick question. I only ask you that because you came in and talked to me a little bit about undecidable questions. But you may not. There's a famous undecidable question. How many people here have taken CS120? OK. So does this question remind you of anything? Paul? The what? Everything we've Every question in 120. OK, there's one question called. Um, uh, post correspondence problem. Maybe you didn't see it. I won't go into it. But undecidable. Oh, yeah. You got a question. Uh, well, okay. Turing undecidable is a, is a uh, term for for um, problems that you can prove do not even have an algorithm that can solve them, regardless of how much time it takes. It doesn't have a finite time algorithm to solve it. And there are problems that you learn about in CS 120 that are uh, undecidable. Turing undecidable, and this problem feels sort of smells a lot like uh, some of those problems, and particularly the one that's called the post correspondence problem is the closest. So when I first looked at this, heard about this problem, I said, well, that's probably undecidable, like lots of questions are, um, because it's, well, not just because it's about an infinite set of, of messages, but it just didn't feel like there would be a finite time algorithm to. Um, to solve this question. But in fact, there is. There's a very efficient algorithm to solve this problem. And in fact, um, people, are, people have conjectured that um, there's a linear time algorithm for this problem, linear in the total length of all the code words. And I've, sp I've spent or wasted a lot of time trying to find a linear time algorithm uh, and, and failed. So part of, my, part of what I'm doing here in, in teaching you about this problem is hopefully infecting somebody who you know, either at the end of this quarter can solve that problem or 10 years later come back and tell me the answer or something. OK, so what I want to show you is a efficient algorithm for solving this problem. And the algorithm is. Uh, based on building a graph, a directed graph, and then looking for uh, particular types of paths in that graph. And we'll prove that if you can't find one of those paths, then the code is uniquely decipherable. And if you uh, can find one of those paths, then it's not uniquely decipherable. OK, so this is, a, this is something that really should use a, um, an example. These do get a little bit messy. But um, so here we're going to build. So here's the solution. First thing is to build a graph G from the code word, the code, and all of its code words. And so when you build a graph, I have to tell you what are the nodes and what are the edges. OK. There's one node in G for each suffix. Of a code word, of any code word. OK? Now a suffix, a suffix is just a part of the string that comes at the end. So if we take the code word ABA, it has a suffix A, it has a suffix BA, and it has the trivial suffix of ABA. So the, the code word itself can be considered as a suffix. Right? We're going to build one, we're going to have one node for each suffix of any code word. Now, you could have the same suffix appear in two different code words. 
So for example, uh, the suffix ba occurs here and occurs here. The suffix a occurs in this one, this one, is three times. Okay, but we're only going to have one node for each suffix, not for each suffix and the code word it comes from, just uh, one node for each suffix that appears in any of the code words. Okay, so for example, um, let me, let's say these are the code words, A, B, A, B, B, A, B, A, A, A. Okay, let's take that as the code. So these are the code words. So these are the trivial suffixes because they, they consist of the code words themselves. And then what are the suffixes? Well, obviously there's a B, as a code word, as a, a suffix B, but I, I better make my example the same way I have it on the paper, otherwise I'm going to get, get confused. There's a, there's a suffix A, there's a suffix B, there's a suffix um, BA, there's a suffix AA, and there's a suffix triple A. Are there any other suffixes that I've missed? So we have the trivial suffixes here, and then we have the non-trivial suffixes here, the ones that really exist. Okay, so this, this set of code words is, is not the same as this example over here, right? It's a different example. All right, so that's the node set of this graph that we're going to build. And then we're going to build, we're going to put in some edges under two different rules, okay? Um, there is a directed edge from the node for suffix u to the node for suffix v. Okay, so u and v, these are variables now that represent suffixes. It's not literally the suffix of just the single character u, and not literally the suffix of the single character v. These are designating, these are, these are uh, variables that represent suffixes. Uh, if, if um, one of two things happens, there is a code word C equals UV. Or two, um, there is a code word C where U equals CV. Okay, so First of all, let me just say, this, is, this small c represents a code word. When I'm talking about the whole code itself, that's written by a big C. Okay, so let me just big C so that we don't confuse an individual code word from the whole code itself. Okay. Now these rules are... Uh, we, we need some examples before you're going to be able to internalize what this means. Okay? Uh, so I'll do examples, don't, don't worry. But this is called a type 1 rule, and this is called a type 2 rule. So let's see if we can find some type 1 rules. So we're looking for a code word which is equal to one of the suffixes that have been enumerated followed by a second suffix that's been enumerated. So, um, for example, AB is a code word. And A is a suffix and B is a suffix. 
Okay, so if we take C, C to be A, B, then we can take U to be A and V to be B, right? So there's a code word C, which is equal to U, followed by V, where U is a suffix and V is a suffix of some code words. The U is a suffix of a code word, V is a suffix of a code word. So here's an example, A, B, U is a, is a suffix of a code word, it's there, B, B is a suffix of a code word, it's there. Okay, so what edge should we put into this graph? Yeah. Between A and B? Yeah, between A and B or from? Oh, yeah, from, from A to B. From A to B, yeah. It's like that, okay? And I could note also, if I want to, that this is a type 1. It's a type 1 edge, and what C is is A, B. Although that's implied because if you want to know what the code word is, you just take this followed by that. Okay, so it's really enough to say that that's a type 1, that's a type 1 edge. Okay, let's look at another type one edge. Um, how about from A B to A? Is that a type one edge? Well, remember what type one says. There should be a code word which is this suffix followed by this suffix. So we're looking for we're looking for a code word which is A B A, and we have that. That's right there. Okay, so this is a type 1 edge also. And um, what about, well, let me just, um, what about B to BA? B to BA? Oh, yeah, right. What about this? Is this a, is this a, uh, a type one edge? Yeah, because this this is asking there should be a type one edge here if there's a code word which is B followed by BA. And there it is, BBA. Okay? So that's a type one. Um, and my example isn't quite complete here. This one uh, what about this? A to triple A. No, because that would mean there'd have to be a code word A with four A's, at least under under type one rules. We haven't looked really closely at type two yet. But there should be one from A to triple to double A, right? Because of of this one. And we, we can put in some more uh, a lot more edges. Now let's look at, at type 2, okay? This one, type 2, maybe is a little bit harder to, to get your head wrapped around. There should be an edge from U to V if it happens that U is equal to C followed by V, where C is a, is a code word. Yeah? Oh, I know why. Because I messed up. Yeah, because when I was looking at this, I was seeing triple A. It's B triple A. And that's, that explains why it wasn't on my paper either. When I was looking at the paper, I was thinking, uh-oh, I screwed up. And in fact, I did, but not then. Not when I wrote it. Yeah, good. So, yeah, so let's just... Um, B A to double A is what I have written on the paper. Okay, and that's right, B A... A, A. So B, A, and B, and tri triple A, and that's that. So this, this B is all the way over there. Okay. Yeah, good. Okay, back, back to type 2. There's a code word C where 
some suffix u is equal to the code word followed by another suffix v. Oh, question? Um, it sounds like what you're proposing is a way of taking a specific message and determining whether that message yeah. is uniquely decipherable. For the problem statement, we don't have messages. Uh, the problem statement is just given the code. And then, yeah. Can we also do B and then A? Yes, I haven't finished all of the, I haven't finished all of this. It gets kind of cluttered. But yeah, definitely there's a B to triple A because B triple A is a, is a code word. And that's, a, that's also a, a type one. So yeah, you can try to look for all of the, um, uh, the type one. I think we're, well, I think we're actually just missing this one, which is the ABA. That's a type one. And this is one, and this is one, and this is one. So if I did this right, I think these are all the type one rules. OK? All right, so let's go on to type two. Type two rules is, again, that we're looking for two suffixes, u to v, where um, u is equal to a code word followed by another suffix. So for example, um, this one. If we have um, U is going to be ABA, and we're going to have C equal AB, and A, I mean, and, and V is A. So does that fit this rule? So ABA, which is a suffix, it's a, tri it's a trivial suffix, but it is a suffix is equal to C, which is a code word, A, B, followed by another suffix, which is A. So it looks like that's a, that's a type 2 rule. OK? Does anybody see any other type 1s or type 2s? Yeah? I have a question. What's the difference between a code word and a suffix again? Or okay, a okay, suffix is just a suffix is the substring that occurs at the end of a string. Any, any one of the suffixes, any one of the, of the substrings that occurs at the end of a string is called a suffix. Okay, so if, if this, is a, this is a code word, the code words are the, are the strings that are actually in the code. And the suffixes of code words are all the strings that occur at the end, are the ends of, uh, of the code words, including the trivial suffix which is the entire code word itself. Okay, so it's any substring that runs all the way to the end of a code word is a suffix. So here we've enumerated uh, for this set of code words, these are the trivial suffixes also, and these are the non-trivial suffixes. Okay, anybody see any other edges that should be in this graph, type one or type two? Yeah. Uh, BBA to BA. BBA to BA, and the reason is that's a type one or type two. Oh, B is not a code word. Never mind. It's a what? Oh, B is not a code word. It's a, never mind. You you retracting this? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it, it, I think this is the whole them, but I could certainly be wrong. Um, okay. So all we've said so far is, this is in the solution, you build this graph. And this is clearly something that's efficient to do. We could, we could do a running time analysis of it, but it's not a big deal uh, to enumerate all the suffixes and um, build this graph, uh, look for um, the rules. It's certainly within polynomial time. It's certainly within something, um, well, at any rate, We'll get to the time analysis in a bit, but it certainly doesn't look horribly inefficient exponential time to build this graph.
Okay, then I'll give you the theorem, which we'll then have to try to justify. Theorem. Um, C is not uniquely decipherable if and only if there is a directed path in G from a node uh, representing a code word if there's a path well, of length GH, GTH, length greater than zero representing a code word to a node representing a code word. Okay? So in these, in these nodes, in the graph, some of the nodes are representing code words. Those are the ones that are here in this example. And some of them are representing suffixes that are not code words. Now, in this graph, do we see a directed path from a node representing a code word to a node representing a code word? I, I put in the extra condition that has to be greater than zero. Otherwise, you might just say, well, a path is from a node to itself trivially of length zero. But that's not of interest. We mean a path that really goes out somewhere and then comes back. Now, it doesn't have to come back to the same code word, although it's permitted to. So the path can go from any code word to any other code word, even itself. But in this particular example, um, there is no directed path from a node that represents a, a code word to any other node that represents a code word, including itself. There is an undirected path, but that's not of interest. Okay. So according to the theorem, this set of, of um, code words, this code is uniquely decipherable. Any message that you create by concatenating these code words, even with repetitions, even uh, with unbounded length, that every, every message that you create that way will be uniquely decipherable. There's only a single possible parse. To, um, to parse that message. On the other hand, if we now add in, um, let's say we add in a new code word here, another code word, so BABB, -B -B. oh, actually, I don't know. I said on the other hand, and that's not true. I don't know yet. B A B B. So why did I why did I pick this one? Just because it generates some more interesting type two edges. And I wanted I wanted to give an example of some type two edges. So if I have B A B B, now um, what additional edges do we have? Okay. Um, well, according to my notes, we have A B B to B. A B B. Where's an ABB? Oh, we have, we have some new suffixes now, too, right? That's a new suffix because it comes from there. All right. And we have a new suffix, which is BB, also. So B we already had, BB, ABB, and then BABB. OK. And now we have ABB goes to B. A, B, B goes to B. And why is that? Because B, A, B, B. Yeah, because you have B, A, B, B, which is a suffix, is equal to 
is equal to, we want it to be type 2, so it should be a code word. This suffix BABB is equal to code word AB fold. Yeah. Hmm? I've reached my limit on how much I can, examples I can, I, after a certain, you know, there's like, they say in psychology you can remember seven things at once and then after that your brain is fried. Uh, there's a limit on how much examples, how much of an example I can actually work through before I just get totally confused. But okay, so this wasn't going to be an example necessarily of one that does have a directed cycle. Let's look at one that we know is not uniquely decipherable and see um, how it has a, a, um, uh, a cycle. Or actually that one. This is, the, this, is, this is so trivial. ABA. So, oh, I erased, I erased that code already that was used for here. But it had definitely an A, B in it, and it had an A in it. And, oh, we can see right here. Um, and it had an A, B, B, and it had a, a B, A, and an A, B. Okay. So, um, and then the, the suffixes that are not here is just B, B, B. Anything else? So it looks like for this example, we have the nodes representing code words, and then we have the suffixes that are not themselves code words. And then we have the type 1 and type 2 edges that should be there. And we've already seen that this is just even the... Um, even the message ABA is not uniquely decipherable because you can write it as a single code word or you can write it as AB followed by A. All right, so we should have edges in this graph that form some directed cycle according to the theorem. Okay, yeah. It's what? Oh, ABA? Okay. Well, where's the cycle? Somebody help me out here, otherwise I'm going to have to try to think in, in, uh, in real time. It's what? ABB to BB. ABB to where? BB. Okay. A is a code word, BB is a suffix, and ABB is a suffix. Right. So is this type 1 or type 2? It's what? One or two? Two. Okay. What else? Uh, A to BA, type one. A to BA, type one. Okay, yeah. Isn't that all we need, though? Isn't that the requirement? Direct path from one code to another? Oh, okay. Yeah, good. Um, Right, right, right. I was thinking of it as a cycle, but it doesn't have to be a cycle a path. Yeah. Okay. From A to B A, there's a directed path from one code word to another code word. All right. So we've proven this theorem by example. We've had two examples, and they both satisfy the theorem. And so that's all you ever have to do to write to prove a theorem. All right. So let's try to prove the theorem. And uh, I'm not going to get through it today. Um, but the proof is essentially constructive. That is, um, when, we, when, uh, when we assume that the code is not uniquely decipherable, we'll have two messages. we have one message with two different parses. And we'll use those parses to actually create a path in the graph that goes from a code word a directed path from a code word to some code word. And then we'll think of it conversely. If you have such a path from a code word to another code word, that should tell you how to generate a single message that has two different parses. Okay, so do one direction.
and I won't even finish that today, unfortunately. Um, okay, so the proof of the theorem will do it the direction assume that the C, the code, is not uniquely decipherable. So that means there's some message that has two different parses. Okay. There's some message. And that message, call it M, is built from the code words of C. There's some message M that has two different parses. Okay, so just pictorially, um, this is going to be a kind of a representation that will be useful. That M starts with one code word in one of the parses. Followed. So this is, this is a code word followed by another code word, followed by another code word, another code word, and so on. So there's little gaps in here, but think of them as all being concatenated. That's, for, that's so your eye can see it. So this is a parse that has one, two, three, four, five code words, the top one. And the bottom one has one, two, three, four, five, six. Just, just to be sure you're clear that you don't have to have the same number. OK? But they both start and they both end at the same place, so they're both spelling out M. There are two different parses of M, which is why this message is not uniquely decipherable. Okay? Among all such M, consider the one, consider the shortest one. Okay, so um, there may be, if the, if the code is not uniquely decipherable, there may be many messages that are not uniquely decipherable. And all we need is one in the argument. And we're going to take the shortest one. That's going to simplify a lot of times in proofs, taking an extreme case, the shortest, the longest, the whatever, um, helps in, uh, in constructing the proof. So here, we're going to take this, the shortest such um, code word. The sort of such message. Okay. Um, then we're going to let in this proof, we're going to let um, C1 and C1 prime These are the first code words in the two different parses. First code words in the two different parses of M. Okay? So we're in this proof, we're assuming first that we have the short. There's a, there, we're assuming there's a counterexample. There's an example that shows that, that the uh, code is not uniquely decipherable. We're looking at the shortest of such examples. And our first observation, well, we call C1 the first uh, code word of one of the parses, and C1 prime the first code word of the other one. And our first observation observe, observe, the length of C1 is not equal to the length of C1 prime. Why is this? Yeah? If they were the same length, they'd have to be the same word. And then they would, um, they wouldn't be short as
Yeah, they wouldn't. Uh, if they were the same, yeah, if they're the same length, they're the same code word. And then you'd have a shorter word um, that has two different parses. Right. Yeah. So let me say this again. Let me say this. If, if these were both the same length, well, we know that they're both equal to the beginning of m. Here's the parse of m. So if they're both the same length and they're both equal to the beginning of m, they're equal to each other. Okay? So this would be saying that they're both they're starting out with the same code word. These two parses are starting out with the same code word. Yet we know the two parses are ultimately different. Okay? So and end up at the same place. So if we, they both started with the same code word, why don't we just consider this as a new message? This is a message with two parses also. And it's shorter than M. And yet we said that M was the shortest the message with the, sh the shortest message with two parses. So it can't be that's, that the two parses begin with the same code word, uh, and therefore it has to be that the two first code words are different length. Okay. And therefore, I'll just make one last statement and then I'll quit for the day. Therefore, at the very beginning, when we look at the two parses, we look at the first two code words that are here. The two, not the first two code words, but the two first code words. One is the long one, and one is the short one. So unambiguously, there's got to be one that's longer than the other. And there's also one that is the overhang. So this piece of it is the overhang. And this, this piece, this, this substring consisting of the overhang, is a suffix of a code word, namely this code word. Okay, so next time we'll, we'll build up the proof and uh, finally give the, give the proof and uh, finish the topic. Okay, so...